saw me running around all the time. The hymnal that Bob had, that I told him what number it was, didn't have those pages in it. <laughs> so that unit's been put back and don't let it come back. <laughs> we were supposed to sing page 15, it started at 18. <laughs> so uh, I, I know some of that song, I know most of it. So uh, anyway, uh, praise the Lord. That, uh, this morning I thought I'd wear a watch, and when I when I first started coming here, I think it was Kenny Cropper, I'm not sure, but he said, when you move here, he says, you don't wear a watch anymore. And uh, I thought, I don't. And, uh, and, you know, where I was before, we always wore watches and everything. But uh, anyway, he was right. I don't wear a watch very much anymore. And uh, so this morning I thought, since I'm preaching, maybe I, we got this up here. Now, since I'm preaching, maybe I'll wear a watch today. And, and so I, I have several watches at home. They're pretty nice watches. And, and so I started going through them. That one's dead. <laughs> I think three of them were dead, and uh, then one of them, uh, it was one of these fishermen watches, it had hour 20, and uh, then I uh, thought, hour 20, what is that? And uh, then, uh, of course, this one that I'm wearing, I had to have Carol reset it, and it, it had, the day was 27 on it, so you can see um, uh, time doesn't mean much when you're having fun. <laughs> so, anyway, pastor's away today and he's asked me if I would share with you and I've got to, to do that. And uh, in my uh, thoughts for today, and you know, the, the the song that you just had was about the banks of the promised land and, and I think I could hear that again, it just uh, really ministers to us as they sing it and praise the Lord for that. And so, I thought, well, Pastor asked me if I'd take Wednesday night and Sunday morning and Sunday evening. He's away on, on a funeral and on his, his pastor friend that's retiring. And so I thought, I think I'll just have kind of a little mini series on uh, heaven. And uh, so uh, Wednesday night we talked about heaven. We talked about it as eternal life, as glory, as rest, as the knowledge, as holiness, as a place of service, worship fellowship and communion with God and so this morning I, I, I'm, I'm thinking about heaven and so I, I picked out a passage uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12 uh, 1 through 10 that we will read a little bit and, and so this we call it Paul's vision of heaven and uh, so as I went through this uh, you know I, I wanted to see what, what Paul saw in heaven and what he heard and of course we've read all these things before and uh, actually, there wasn't a whole lot about heaven in this passage. And it was more about what he learned on earth. And I think it really applies to us also uh, through this time. Uh, especially as we, we go through our prayer list and see the, the things that many of us go through as we mature in our life. And uh, so, uh, we want to read this passage and... And so this is 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verses 1 through 10. So I want to read that first and then I'll be going back through it and, and talking about different things in it. It is doubtless not proper for me to boast. I will come to visions and revelations in the Lord, of the Lord. And I, just before I go on and read the whole thing, before in the chapter 11, Paul had been talking about... Uh, his unwillingness to boast. But it's like these super apostles that was in the church in Corinth, Corinth uh, almost made him boast. And he, he talked about in chapter 11 about how he was beat up, he was in shipwrecks, he was in prison, and all those things that he was boasting. And so he says, now I want to let you know that uh, I, I said all these things and now you are, you are almost making me boast. And so we read it in that vein. It is doubtless not proper for me to boast. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, and that's, that was himself, he knew a man in Christ 14 years ago, whether in body, I do not know, whether out of the body, I do not know, God knows, for such a one was caught up to the third heaven. 
And I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows how he was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words, which is not lawful for me or a man to utter. Of such a one I will boast, yet of myself I will not boast, except in my infirmities. For though I might desire to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will speak the truth. But I refrain, lest anyone should think of me above what he sees me to be or hears from me. And lest I should be exalted above measure, by the abundance of revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with God three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly will I rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And so what a chapter, that when he's weak, then he's strong. And I, I think uh, many of us come to the place of weakness, uh, in, in, even in our physical situations like he had, and we kind of identify with him. Uh, maybe, maybe some of them are not because of what we've done for Christ and so on. It's just a matter of the afflictions that come upon us in life. But in verses 1 through 6 of this passage, Paul reluctantly describes his vision. He, 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 it's just like he's saying, you are making me say these things. Not that he wanted to boast himself. In the previous chapters, he said, it's, it's like he said, you people are thinking you, you are the super Christians. You think you are super apostles. You think that I don't, that what, what I'm doing doesn't uh, matter or mean anything. And so uh, he, he is kind of in that chapter uh, showing the sufferings that he's gone through. And, uh, and now he shares those with us. And so he said 14 years ago, and we don't know when that was, but 14 years ago, he was caught up uh, to the third heaven, to paradise. But he, he was saying, I'm not going to boast about it. Uh, it's not something that I want to um, get a fat head, as we would say, about this. That it's not something I'm going to boast about. Uh, many people in the Bible have had visions and revelations. Um, I'm I just going to list several of them really quickly. Uh, you remember Zacharias? Uh, he was uh, talked to by the angels. Uh, Jesus was transfigured before them. The women at the tomb saw an angel. Stephen looked up and he saw God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Peter saw an angel in prison that loosed him. John at the Isle of Patmos saw and visions. And Paul on his shipwreck, he uh, saw uh, an angel that talked to him and he said, don't worry, everybody's going to be saved. And so different ones had received different revelations, but, but Paul said he had received revelations. And, and even Paul, you remember one time he was going up to the city of, of uh, Damascus, and a light shined around the valley, and God spoke to him there. And he said, why persecutest thou me? He said, the rest of the people didn't hear that or didn't, didn't know what it was, but he knew what it was. And so, yes, he had a lot of things that he could brag about. Now... As we, uh, we, we list, let, let's pick on politics. We're not preaching on politics. But we, we see candidates running, how great I am. <laughs> you know, and it's just like, I am wonderful, I am great, I can do this and that. And Paul wasn't saying that. He said, I'm going to brag about my infirmity. I'm going to brag about how, how small I am, how, how insecure I am, or how I can't, you know, I can do nothing. But he says, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. And so he had the proper outlook. Uh, he knew. He said he in verse 2a, he says, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago 
Whether in body, I do not know. Whether out of the body, I do not know. And so he said there, he in verses 1, 2, 3, he, he, he talks about in a third person. He didn't say, now I was caught up to the third heaven. He says, I know a man in Christ. And it's like he's talking about himself, but it's like he's talking about somebody else. That I knew a man in Christ, and I don't know whether he's in body or out of body. And uh, so, you know, we, we, we've known, I've known people that have said that, that they've seen some amazing things too. And some of them I don't doubt. Like this one lady, she was uh, Mrs. Richards, Carol. He, she was 104 years old. And she, we had services in the rest home uh, for years and years. And Mr. R Mrs. Richard was one of our people, like you are, that came to our local church there in town. Well, she went into the rest home, 104 years old. She still came to the services as she could. But the day that she died, she told the nurses, this is the day she's leaving. And she said, they said, why is that? She said, I see the angel standing over there waiting. And so did she see an angel? Well, she said she did. And she died that day. And so, I mean, we don't understand everything. And we, 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 God doesn't show these things to us to give us a fat head and, and break about. But, you know, God does minister to our souls in, in strange ways sometimes. So, he, he, um, he said he knew a man in Christ 14 years ago. And uh, remember one time at Lystra, when he was going on his missionary journeys, he went in there and he preached and they stoned him and they drug him outside the city and laid him on the ground. And uh, uh, we don't know exactly when, when all these things happened, but this could have been the time that they drug him out and left him for dead along the road. And God could have taken him to heaven in body or out of body, uh, whatever it was. He says, I don't know. But he, he felt like he knew what he, he saw that he, he had this, this delight. And uh, then, you remember, they came and found his body out there, and they, they got a hold of him, and lo and behold, he came back to life, or if he was dead, we don't know whether he was alive or dead, but he came back, and the next day, he went back into the city and preached the gospel again. And were they ever surprised? So. <laughs> well, it's interesting. He said... Um, he kind of been quiet about this for, for 14 years. It wasn't something he was going around every day and said, you know, two years ago I did this, three years ago I did that, five years ago this, you know. He, he says here, 14 years ago. It's like, he didn't go around shouting about this all the time, but it's like he said, you have forced me to say these things. You think you are <coughs> super apostles. And he says, I too know God. I too have had revelation. I too have had visions and so on. He was caught up to the third heaven. Okay, are there three heavens? Oh, let's see. The first heaven would be the place where the birds fly, you know. We have we have birds that fly around our place, crows and, and all kinds of buzzards. Buzzards, yes. <laughs> so, are there buzzards in heaven? Yes, there are buzzards. The first heaven. Uh, then the starry heaven would be the second heaven. And so uh, then whatever else passed the, the starry heaven. And, you know, they're, they're starting to say more and more that it, it doesn't seem like there's any end to the universe. Where is it? We don't know. But it's interesting that Stephen looked up and saw God and Jesus standing on the right hand. And uh, so was he looking clear to heaven or did they come down? Or just what? It talks about the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven. Does that mean just the starry heaven? I don't know. But uh, anyway, it starts making you think is that and that's what we want to do. And so he was caught up to the third heaven. And then he says uh, it, was, it was paradise. And uh, I'm looking for that word in verse 4. He was caught up into paradise, and uh, someone said that paradise was kind of a, a Persian word, and this Persian word meant a luxurious garden in a royal estate. 
And so he was caught up to, and that's just a that's just a picture word. And that's not what heaven is. That is just a luxurious garden like like King Nebuchadnezzar. But it's a it, it was like a, a beautiful place like God would have. And uh, further described for the the holy city of New Jerusalem in the last. And so uh, he said. Next, he said, and, and what he saw, he says, it was inexpressible words. He, he said, I just can't. In one place, he said, it was not lawful for me to utter, not lawful for me to say. And we would be saying, uh, well, Paul, what did you see? What did you hear? Uh, Paul, did you, did you see uh, Gabriel? Did you see uh, Jesus, did you see this? And then we, we would be wanting to know, well, Paul, what did you see? What did you hear? He says, I can't tell you. <coughs> and I can't tell you about it. It was a Persian, Persian word. Uh, the most beautiful garden. We say the garden of prayer. The garden that gets it, not gets it. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, try to explain something you can't explain. And I was, I was thinking, okay, what's, what's wonderful that you can't explain? And I was going to pick up on Shirley down here. And she makes this, uh, what is it, almond ice cream every year. Brings it to church, different kinds of ice cream. And uh, so anyway, there's that pecan. Butter pecan. But butter pecan. Now, how do you describe that? Uh, well, it's sweet, and it's cold, and it's... Um, I don't know, but it's good. <laughs> so, just can't quite ex can't quite explain it uh, to you. But if you taste it, you know it. And so, how do you explain some of those things? The Apostle John attempted to uh, describe the holy city, the New Jerusalem, and I'm sure that he fell short of explaining what that beautiful garden in heaven is. We we sit on our side of the lake and we see the sunsets, and you can kind of explain the sunsets because. Many of us, probably all of us, have seen the sun going across the lake. Um, but Paul said, it's not lawful for me to utter. Uh, it, it's not lawful for me that, it, that it, it might be something that I would glory in this before you. And so he says, I'm, I'm not going to boast on how great I am, uh, but I'm going to boast on my infirmities. He says in verse 5, he says, Of such a one I will boast, that is, the one who was caught up of the Lord. That was there. For such a one I will boast, uh, yet of myself I will not boast except in my infirmities. And so, uh, less, less in verse 6, that they should think too highly of me. For though I might desire to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will speak the truth. But I refrain, lest anyone should think of me above what he sees me sees me to be, or hears from me. And so Paul didn't want to boast. Uh, what was it? One of the beatitudes: be poor in spirit, wasn't it? And so, don't don't act like you're so great. But uh, uh, what did you see, Paul? And so, uh, in verse seven, we see the, that he was given a thorn in the flesh, and. Uh, so, given the thorn in the flesh, and you know the problem that, that we have sometimes when we are blessed too much is we get too much pride, don't we? We, we think that we are better than some other people. That uh, I've memorized 50 verses in my life. I'm the super memorizer. But, uh, <laughs> no, no. Uh, <coughs> There's many things that, that bring pride to us, and God doesn't want his people to have that pride, lest we be exalted above measure. And so God has blessed many of us with all kinds of different talents, and we, can, we, we join together and praise the Lord together with those talents that we have, but we're not to go about uh, telling everybody about how great we are. Well, he was given a thorn. And uh, the thorn was probably something that everyone could see. And uh, uh, it was no secret. Uh, why the, the word thorn really has the idea of not just one of these little rose thorns, but the, the word has the idea of a tent stake. 
you know, something big, something that really hurt. Uh, where would you put a tent stake in, in your foot? That would hurt, wouldn't it? Uh, you step on a, a thorn, that hurts. But how about a tent stake? Or else a tent stake in your shoulder? Uh, and, and so we, we've different ones that have had things that, that we don't like, and we think, I think I would rather have the, the tent stake than this. And so we have troubles. Well, the thorn was given, a tent stake. And it was something that God gave to him, but Satan was using it. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Both God and Satan was using this, this tent stake, this thorn in his life. And Satan was using it to buffet him. Now today, if, if we had a thorn in the flesh, we would go to some counselor. And I got kind of a kick out of this. You go to a counselor, and, you know, we have different ones that counsel us in our needs. I'm, I'm not talking about our pastor, but others, you know. And they might say, well, first of all, you need to have a positive male attitude. <laughs> Just have a positive male attitude, and this will... <coughs> This will, will help you. And that doesn't hurt to have that. But they'd say a positive mental attitude. That, that's what you need. And another one might say, well, you need to draw from the power that's deep within you. You know, bring it up. Bring that you, you, you have the strength in yourself. Just draw from the power that's deep within you. And you, you won't put your mind on that tent stake that's in your shoulder. Uh, still hurts, doesn't it? And another might say, well, you need to go to a support group. You know, you go to a support group and everybody's telling you about all their problems and you will realize that other people have more problems and, and they're going through a harder thing than you are. And that might not hurt. Do you think Paul went to a support group? I don't know. But anyway, you got the support group, the deep, deep drawing deep from within you, the positive mental attitude, and... Uh, then this last one really gets me. It says, if you had faith, you know, if you, if you had the faith, if you really had faith, you'd get over it. And uh, that's like me one time, my blessed little mother, one time uh, I came to see her, and, and we had a little, a little church. I was a pastor of a little church somewhere, and, and you know, like, 10 or 15 or 20 people, I don't even know how many was there. But uh, we had just a small church, and my mother said, well, if you just really pray hard, God would bring all the people in and it'd just be filled. And I thought, you know, I've already prayed hard like that. <laughs> <laughs> and still they're not coming in. And uh, so her, her idea, if you just really prayed hard. And uh, so anyway, we have all these counselors today that, uh, we need to go to the wonderful counselor of the mighty God, the Lord Jesus Christ, and have him. Well, Paul's prayer regarding the thorn in the flesh. And we talked about that in Sunday school this morning, didn't we? That uh, you talked about whether you pray once or twice or three times or more. Anyway, Paul in this, let's see, we read verse 8. Where is it? Now concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And so here he had this this real problem. And uh, he'd been, I'm, I'm just kidding, he's been to support groups and he's been to all these other, the positive attitudes, he's been, he, and I'm just kidding. But anyway, he came to the Lord, the wonderful counselor. And what was this, this stake in the flesh? Some people think my, maybe his eyesight, and some people think it was he had headaches or eye. Uh, eyes or headaches or uh, I think toothaches or uh, ulcers or, or who, who knows what but he had some kind of physical thing that perhaps everybody could see and, and uh, made him not to look so great but he prayed three times uh, that God would take this from him and uh, somebody, somebody said somebody brought out about different kinds of prayer and, and so uh, I, I thought I'd just write this down and say it's not the arithmetic of our prayers, not the rhetoric, the geometry, or the length of our prayers. It's not the music of our prayers, the logic of our prayers, the divinity of our prayers, but 
the heartfelt prayer before God that we raise that up before the Lord. And so I'm sure that Paul prayed about that. Uh, it's not the gifts but the graces that we need. And so Paul prayed and prayed and prayed about this, but God didn't take it from him. And so we, we sometimes have problems that we have to live with that we don't like. And so uh, Paul said he prayed and prayed, and God didn't do anything. But, he, but God told him no. And God, in the next phrase, God said, my grace is sufficient for thee. I got a poem that I wrote uh, year 13. I might have read it to you before, but you won't remember. So, <laughs> because, because we all have a, a thorn in the flesh, it's called a memory. And so, okay, it, this is called When God Says No. You know, sometimes we pray and pray and we don't get the answer. But, uh, you know, when God says no. When God says no to our prayers, we will have his tender embrace. When God says no unto our cares, he gives us his loving grace. To live with God and God remain is more than any inward pain. On Pishka's mount, Moses did stand. He shared with God his great desire. He sought to walk that special land. God said no, but from heaven's choir, he viewed the north, the east, the west, a promised land that God would bless. Paul, pain in, in his flesh with a thorn, cried out to God for his relief. Yet God would not remove the scorn, but allowed Paul to suffer grief. God said to Paul, when on his knees, my grace is sufficient for thee. Paul was caught up to paradise. He heard words he could not utter. When there he met a man in Christ, yet on earth his body did shudder. Paul was never so close to heaven's glow as on the day when God said no. And I think that's sometimes what happens with us. You know, we pray and pray about something, but then we realize God is saying no, and we are realizing that God's grace is sufficient for us. Paul was just going to boast in his infirmities. Today, if somebody was caught up to heaven, and we know that books have been written about, there's one book that one of my kids wrote and said I should read it. it was, I think it was 90 minutes. He was dead for 90 minutes and went to heaven. Maybe some of you read it, and I read it. And, well, maybe he was, I don't know. But anyway, Paul wouldn't boast about him himself going to heaven. But today, they write books about it, about tapes and videos and tours. And they might be on Fox News. And uh, they might make movies of him going to heaven. But Paul, but Paul felt uh, the need not to dwell on it. He didn't want them to think that he was some kind of super apostle. And so sometimes we think that we are super. But uh, God gave it to him for his benefit. And God gave it for him to sustain him also. And so uh, we mentioned about the thorn may have been a headache or something. But uh, God's provision for Paul. God said uh, to me, uh, not what Paul wanted to hear, but God said, my grace is sufficient for you. Grace is God's approval. It means God likes us. God loves us. God, we're in his favor. Grace is available at all times uh, for us. Grace, it is the very strength of God. Grace is the favor and love of God in action. Grace, God's grace and grace and love. Uh, somebody pointed out, as I was reading this, I think it was John Bunyan, I'm not going to read it, but anyway, he's saying that those, I don't know if there's five words there, but anyway, five words came out to him as he looked at that phrase, my grace is sufficient for you. The first is my, that means God. It's, it's God's grace. It's, it's God, my 
grace. You know, that's God's kindness and love. And so it, it's, it's God's kindness and love and care. My grace is, I thought, the only thing point out is, yeah, is is present. That means it's right now. It's not in the past. It's not in the future. But he said, my grace is right now. So it's God's love, kindness is right now. Are you going through a problem right now? God's grace is, and then the word sufficient. You know, it's, it's not more than you need, not less than you need. It's just what you need. It's sufficient for you. And is sufficient for you. It's like God wrote up a prescription. You go to the doctor and he writes up a prescription. You go down, sometimes uh, I go, I, I know I've gone to the doctor and he writes out a prescription and I go to the pharmacist and they said, well, this will be $400. <laughs> And I go back to the doctor and he says, oh, well, we can do, and, and the next one they go and say, oh, this is $4. And I said, um, well, was one more sufficient than the other? No, it just costs more. But with God, <laughs> it's, it's my grace is sufficient for you. God knows the, the, the formula for us. And so... Um, so God was God gave him a thorn in the flesh. And I got to end by my thorn in the flesh. Uh, as, I, as I was thinking about this the other day, I wrote up another poem called called Thorns. And uh, you know, sometimes we have these thorns in the flesh and problems. Thorns are not a friend of man, but God can use what we despise. We clear the brush off of the land that we may walk in paradise. Our feet do hurt and they do mourn when we step on just one thorn. God's strength is made known in weakness and not in the strength of man. God's strength is seen in man's meekness. God gives him strength to make him stand. God's greatest gift is a jewel adorned that pricks the flesh with painful thorns. Thorns in our life have different looks. Beautiful flowers give us their smiles. The flowers of God grow by the brooks, but their thorns are a real trial. But the most beautiful flower adorned was wrapped up in a crown of thorns. And so you think of what the Lord endured for us. God's grace was sufficient for him as he was on the cross. God's grace is sufficient for us. So, as I study this passage, I say, well, Paul, what did you teach me about heaven? He says, I can't tell you. <laughs> I can't tell you what I thought about heaven. And what did you see? Well, I saw paradise. I saw the th third heaven. Well, what, what do you tell me about heaven? I want to see what, what, what happened. He said, I just learned that God's grace is sufficient for me. And you know, if, that, if we can learn that, that's heaven on earth for us to find grace. What song are we singing today? Number no, 320. Page 320. Shall we stand? <coughs> Number 320. Turn your eyes upon Jesus.
Father, thank you for this wonderful message we've heard today and know that your grace is sufficient for us in everything we see and do. Be with us now as we go our separate ways and be with the election as it comes out. And no matter what, we know that your hand will be upon us. We ask all these things.